What's going on guys? Welcome back to Raider World. So in this video, we have Fueling's Race Series Cam Chest Kit for the Milwaukee 8 engine. Available for Milwaukee 8s and twin cam engines in either HP or Race Series configuration, and with a wide variety of cams to choose from, this cam chest kit from Fueling is guaranteed to take your Harley to the next level. These cam chest kits include all the necessary components from top to bottom, conveniently packaged under one part number, making this a one click and done ordering process. This leaves all the guessing work out, leaving you confident that you're getting everything you need for a successful install. Now, if you do plan to install the seal on the back of the oil pump, Harley part number 624-00205, you do have to purchase that separately from your local Harley-Davidson. I suggest ordering that as soon as you order your kit. Now for my setup, I did choose to go with the Reaper 472 cam because I like the flex and the higher RPMs. Now it does produce a little less low end torque, but I reap the benefits in the mid to top end range and really get after it. Now if you're the type of rider who spends more time in the low to mid range and are looking for torque right off idle, then the well-known 465 grind is a great option. Now, if you're looking for more information on all the kits Fueling offers, I highly recommend you go to the Fueling Parts website and check them out. So without further ado, let's get this kit unboxed and install on the bike. All right, so to start this off, I did go with the race series option over the HP Plus. So here we have the Reaper 472 camshaft. I already explained why I went with this option. Now here we have the high volume oil pump. Now the HP Plus and the race series oil pump share the exact same gear sizes, but what separates them is the actual housing and material. The race series is machined from 7075 billet aluminum compared to the HP Plus of 6061. This makes the race series pump 50% stronger and allows it to hold a tighter tolerance under temperature changes. It also has slightly deeper scavenge kidneys to help increase the scavenging capability over the HP Plus pump. Now when you're ordering your oil pump, you just wanna make sure you're ordering the right one, whether it's oil cooled or water cooled. So here we have the high flow M8 cam plate made of 7075 billet aluminum, which is 50% harder and stronger than the Harley factory cast and guaranteed to increase engine oil flow and volume. And when you match it with Fueling's Race Series oil pump, you're looking at a real wheel power gains of two horsepower and two foot pounds of torque. So here we have the hydraulic roller lifters. So the HP Plus and Race Series lifters both offer optimized flow rates, meaning they deliver more oil to the top end. However, the Race Series lifters also have a tighter internal tolerance. This allows the Race Series lifter to stay pumped up more efficiently which provides more valve train stability and a quieter running engine. So here we have the one piece or fixed push rods. These feature a heavy duty 7 16 diameter tube design that are heat treated with a black oxide finish and are designed to work with fueling, stock and Screaming Eagle Milwaukee 8 camshafts. Now the quick install push rods are obviously easier to install, but they can't compare to a solid push rod in strength and durability. It's a little extra work, but a lot more rewarding. So here we have the Timkin cam bearing. This needle camshaft bearing is made here in the USA and offers extra rollers with less spacing, making this a substantial upgrade over stock. And here we have all new rock arm studs and nuts, gaskets, O-rings, ARP cam and crank fasteners, washers, Molly lube and Loctite. And also Fueling gives you all the instructions, tech tips and guides.
These Gorilla rocker shafts have over double the strength of factory rocker shafts, a precision ground from 4140 HT steel, gas nitrate, and final surface treated. Fueling absolutely use the best possible material and heat treat process available to create the best rocker shaft on the market. Custom tooling was created to provide a countersink relief versus machining away the entire end of the shaft per the factory design. Recommended for all MA engines and especially for engines running higher lift camshafts and heavier valve spring pressures. So once I pull off and disassemble the Harley stock, I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison and I'll point out a few key differences between the Harley stock and fueling. Now for this install, I did use a variety of tools. I won't cover them here. I'll cover them more throughout the video because that would just take up a whole separate video. But these are just some of the specialty tools that I used. The Jim's USA screw organizer kit, foot pound torque wrench, inch pound torque wrench, the Motion Pro adjustable torque wrench adapter. Now I don't like using adapters to get my torque values down, but in some cases in those tight spaces where you can't fit a torque wrench, these do come in handy. The cam crankshaft sprocket locking tool, a couple of feeler gauges, spark plug gauge. I did use the Jim's USA cam bearing remover and installer tool, the oil pump alignment tool from Jim's USA, a small ratchet set. These do come in handy for those tight spaces and a flexible hose clamp plier. And lastly, I do have the fueling pinion shaft runout tool just to ensure that the crank is true and how it's in. Some people say only use this if you're converting from a chain drive to a gear drive that a chain drive is more forgiving because it has more flex or play in it. But you should always check your crank run out if you're doing any type of cam work. And why not check it since you're already in there? Now, before I get started, I do have to strip the bike down of some parts. Now your setup might be different, so I won't go too in detail. So I'll start off by removing the seat, the saddlebags, both side covers, and mid-frame heat deflectors. So now I'll remove the tank, but first I'm gonna purge the fuel line. I'll disconnect the great connector for the fuel tank, and then I'll run the starter until it stalls. And then I'll run the starter again for an additional three seconds. Now I'll remove the main fuse and disconnect the negative battery cable. And now I'll disconnect the fuel line. I'll just pull up on this collar and it'll pop right out. Now for the tank, you have these two hoses. On the left, you have a vent hose. You just disconnect it here. And on the right, you have an overflow hose. You might have to cut a couple of zip ties and then just pull it out. And now to completely remove the tank, you have these two bolts in the back and two bolts in the front, and they're a half inch. Now the two bolts in the front have a plastic cover. You can just pop those off. Now before I remove anything else, I'm gonna start draining the engine oil. That way when I install the new cam chest kit, it has all new oil cycling through. So now I'll remove the air cleaner. I do have the older style Screaming Eagle heavy breather. I won't be putting this one back on because I have Fueling's all new BA air cleaner. Now I'll remove the right floorboard brackets. Now your setup might be different. I do have the Thrash and Supply floorboards with Ciro's adjustable highway peg mounts. So now I'll remove the exhaust. I do have the Tap Performance 2 and a 2 head pipe with the 50 cal slip-ons. So I will not be reusing these O2 sensors. I do have the DinoJet Target Tune that I received from Tab. I'll be doing a whole dyno jet tune with that in a later video. All right guys, now that I have everything off, in order to work in this area here, I'm gonna remove the old coolant lines so I can access the rock recovers. So before you get too far into it, I do suggest you do a short video or maybe take some pictures of all your connectors and your fittings. That way, when you go back to reinstall everything, you can go back to those pictures or that video and plug everything back in exactly where it goes. So first, I'm gonna remove the upper engine mount. I'll remove the screw for the stabilizer bar that's going into the frame. And then I'll remove the two lower screws on the bracket that are going into the head. And for these screws, I'm using a 916 socket.
So now I'll disconnect the knock sensors, but first I'll remove the horn. Now you don't have to completely remove the horn, you just have to disconnect it, but I'm just getting it out of the way so I can show you where the knock sensors are. And to remove the horn assembly, I'm just removing these two screws and they're a 916 socket. Now here you have your cable for your horn. Just pull it out of this retention clip. And you have your two connectors up here and you can just pull those out. And here you have one more retention clip and I'll just use a plastic prying tool to pry it out. So here you have your front and rear knock sensor and then your connectors are up here. Now you only need to disconnect them right here. So to disconnect your knock sensors, just pull back on the clip here to get it off the mounting plate on the top so it's free. And then you have this gray retention clip. It's currently in the lock position. You just wanna push it up. You'll hear it click. And once it's all the way forward, just push up on that gray clip and your connector will slide out. So now I'll disconnect the two fuel injector connectors. You have a gray connector towards the front and a black connector towards the rear. Just push on this clip here, and it'll pop right up. So now I'll disconnect the two automatic compression release valves or your ACR valves. So if you're wondering what these ACR valves do, they just reduce the strain on your motor when you're starting it, just helps the engine to turn over easier, which results in less wear on your starter and battery. So when you're starting your engine, these valves will open and then after your bike starts, they'll close to restore to full compression. So you have a clip here, just pull down on that and it'll pop out. Now I'll disconnect the two left side spark plug wires and then remove the spark plugs. Now to remove the spark plugs, I'm using a 5 8 deep socket. So I am gonna replace my spark plugs with the Screaming Eagle spark plugs. Now, do they make a difference? Absolutely not. So here I have a gap tool, but if you're keeping your spark plugs, uh, you wanna be between 0.031 and 0.035. Now, when I did check this one, this was way low. So you can use this tool to kind of pull up on it to get a better gap. And then I'll properly set. So now it's time to disconnect the coolant lines. But before I do that, I'll prep the area with some rags and some pig mat in case I spill any oil. So the front down tube goes down here and then you have a clamp. So here I'm just using a pair of flexible hose clamp pliers. Just makes it a little easier to get these clamps off. So for this rear down tube, the manual does say to disconnect it down by the transmission fitting, but it's a little easier to disconnect it right here. So now that I have the front and the rear down tubes disconnected, I'll disconnect the manifolds for the front and the rear. Now the manifolds have two screws and I'm using a 3-8 socket. So the two screws for the front manifold are a little hard to get to because of the coolant line, so I'm using a smaller ratchet. So once you get the screws loose enough, I would just use a wrench to get them out the rest of the way. So now that I have everything disconnected for the coolant lines, I'll get all these connectors out of the way and then pull them out. So as soon as you pull the manifolds out, you will have some oil come out. And then just slowly work them out. You don't want to damage them. So now that I have those oil coolant lines removed, I'll remove the upper rocker covers and I'll start off by removing the two spark plug wires on the right side. Now before I remove these rocker covers, I'm going to make sure that the area is clean. I'll use some low compressed air and blow off the top so I don't get anything inside the engine. Now for the screws on the upper rocker covers, you have 10 on each one and there are 7 16s. So I like to break them all loose first 
and then remove them. Now with some of these screws, I will be using a smaller ratchet, especially for the one in the rear. It's a little tight to get to. So for all my screws, I do have the Jim's USA hardware organizer kit. Now you don't need something like this. You can take a piece of cardboard and sketch out your part, poke some holes into it, and put your screws into there. So I am using a smaller ratchet with a socket to get to the rear screw. Now once I get up far enough where I can take the ratchet out, I'll take the socket off. I do have a wrench adapter on the end of this socket, and then I'll use the wrench to get it out the rest of the way. I also like to mark my covers, so I'm putting the same one on the same head. Now that I have the covers removed, this is a good time to get the old gaskets off. So now I'll remove the rocker arms so I can access those push rods and pull them out. But before that, I'm gonna throw the bike into six gear so I can rotate the motor a little easier. Now before I remove the rocker arms, I need to find base circle. All this means is that the cam lobes are at their lowest point so they're not putting any excess tension onto the spring valves and trying to open them. Now you can start in the front or the rear. It doesn't really matter. You just wanna find the base circle on one of them so you can remove those rocker arms. So I'm gonna start by removing the front first. So I'll watch the rear. So I'll rotate the tire and I'll watch the rocker arms move. Now the closest push rod here is the intake and the push rod here is the exhaust. When they're going down, they're closing. When they're coming up, they're opening and then you'll feel compression. And that's why we take the spark plugs out. Now you're gonna watch these two push rods go down and up, open and close. And once the two look like they're moving together, that's when the front is at top dead center and we can remove the front. So right now the intake is opening and closing. You feel compression. That's why we take those spark plugs out. So now you see the exhaust is opening. Now it's closing. Now they look like they're both moving together. That means the front is at top dead center. That means it just has less tension and we can remove these rocker arms. Now another method you could use is taking a straw and putting it inside the spark plug hole so it's sitting on top of the piston. Then you just rotate the tire and you feel the piston go up and down and then once it reaches the top and it feels like it's gonna drop, that's how you know you're at top dead center. Now something else you can check is by shaking the rocker arm. There should be some play in it. That's how you know there's not much tension on those spring valves. Now on the rear, you can see and hear that there's zero play, so you know that they're under spring tension. So for the four rocker arm screws, I'll take them out evenly, but before that, I'll do a quarter turn on each one. And to remove these screws, I'm using a 5 16 12 point socket. So these are still under some tension, so they will be a little tight. And once they're all fingered loose, you can go ahead and thread them out. So when I remove these rocker arms, I'll mark them so I know which one goes where. Now the reason I mark these is because everything develops a wear pattern, so I like to put them back in the exact same spot unless I'm changing them out. So now we wanna find top dead center for the rear, so I'll rotate the tire, and I'll feel the push rods as they open and close. So it's opening, closing. So now these two are moving together. I don't know if you can see it on my fingers, 
but the exhaust and intake push rods are moving together. So I'll go ahead and remove the rear. Same thing, I'll do a quarter turn on each one to break them loose. So in the kit, Fueling does provide you with all new Rockrom studs and nuts, so I won't be reusing these. Now before you take the push rods out, this is only if you're reusing the stock push rods. I would note which one goes where, that way you put them back in the same spot. Now each push rod, usually the Harley Davidson stock ones, are marked blue for the intake and yellow for the exhaust. So if you haven't noticed yet, I have been working from the top to the bottom. This is just the way I do it. Now you can go either way, but now I'm gonna remove the push rod covers and the tappet covers. Now I won't be keeping these because I do have the Harley Davidson gloss black ones and I'll be replacing these with those. So in order to remove these push rod covers, just pull down on the spring cap. It's under some spring tension and then just take a picking tool or a screwdriver and pop this top spring cap retainer off and then you can remove it. Now with these push rod covers, I will keep some of the components so I can assemble the new ones. Now also, don't forget to take the O-rings out. You have two on the top and two on the bottom. Now in the kit, Fueling also provides you with all new O-rings. So now I'll remove these two tappet covers or lifter covers. You have four screws on each one. So I'm using a 316 hex bit and a 316 Allen. Now that I have all the screws out for the lifter covers, I'll lightly tap them with a rubber mallet to knock them loose. So here you have your two anti-rotation devices or your lifter cuffs or tappet cuffs. So these tappet cuffs just act as guides to keep the lifter from spinning. You have these two screws here and these are a 3 8 socket. Just make sure you're taking your time when you're removing these screws. As you can see here, it's marked R for rear, and the other one is marked F for front. Now same thing, before you remove these lifters, if you are reusing the stock lifters and just going with a camshaft, I would mark which location they were in, that way you put them back the same way. All right, so now it's time to remove the camshaft cover. You have nine screws and there are 3 16 hex bit. Just make sure you have a catch pan underneath to catch any of that oil. Now I'll just lightly tap the cover with a rubber mallet until it comes off. Now I'll just take this gasket off. Now that I have the cam cover off, I can start to disassemble the Harley stock cam chest assembly. Before I do that, I'm gonna make sure my timing dots are lined up and then I'll remove the cam chain tensioner. And for these two screws, I'm using a T27. So if you're not replacing your cam chain tensioner, 
Just check it for any excess wear. So here you have your cam sprocket and your crank sprocket. Now before I remove these along with the chain, I'm just gonna mark the chain on the top here because these chains do develop wear over time. So I wanna put it in the exact same spot. So I do have this crank cam sprocket locking tool. This just goes in between the sprockets just to keep them in place while I'm taking out the screws. So the top screw is gonna be a 916 socket and the bottom screw is gonna be a half inch. So just make sure when you're taking these out, you keep track of your spacers. So I'll take out both sprockets and chain together. So you can take the cam plate and the oil pump out together as one. Just remove the outer screws. The inner screws are for your oil pump, but I'm gonna take out the cam plate first and then the oil pump. That way I already have them separated so I can do a side-by-side -side comparison between the fueling and the stock. And for all these screws, it's a 316th hex bit. So here you have another spacer, it's kind of stuck on there. It's easier to get off once you get the cam plate off. And now I'll just remove the stock camshaft And don't forget the two O-rings. So here we have Fueling's crankshaft run out measuring tool. It does come in a couple pieces. You have your tool plate here, then you have your thumb screws, and then your dowel indicator that just slides into here. And then you have a set screw on the back, which tightens down on this dowel indicator so it's not moving up and down. Now Fueling does recommend that you clean off the tip of the pinion shaft with some 800 grit. Obviously you always want a clean surface when you're doing this. So I'll just put the dial indicator into the plate. Then you have a 332nd set screw on the back. I'll just tighten that down. You can use an Allen or a hex bit. You don't want this dial to move at all while it's in there or it'll give you a false reading. And then just line it up on the crankcase. Now you want these thumb screws on there nice and snug. You don't want any play in the plate or it'll falsify your reading. So I'll just take this dial where it says zero and I'll line it up with the needle. And I'll just lock it into place up here. So now that this is locked in, everything's set into place. Now, even though I have it set at zero now, I'm gonna rotate the motor a couple of times because I wanna find true zero. You'll probably see that needle drop and that's where I wanna set it. So as you can see, the needle dropped and it's looking like it's staying right about here. So I'll loosen this up and I'll turn my dial back. I'll lock this down and then I'll rotate the tire a couple more times just to confirm my zero. So measuring the crank run out, it looks like I'm at exactly four thousandths. So fueling recommends a maximum of 5,000 crankshaft run out plus play. So all I'm gonna do is take the crankshaft screw and screw it back in. So I'll lift up on the pinion shaft to measure the initial flex and play in the crank bearings. And then I'll just take this number and add it to the crankshaft run out. And it looks like I'm at 1,000. So taking the crank run out of 4,000 plus the thousands of play and flex in the pinion shaft, I'm looking at a total of 5,000 which is what fueling recommends. So all this means is that I'm within serviceable specs. I'm good with a chain drive, just not a gear drive. So now that I measured the crank run out and we're good to go, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the cam bearing. I am using the Jim's USA cam bearing removal tool. It's a pretty simple tool. It allows you to remove the cam bearing and also install it. So if you look at the tool here, it says install. So if you can read install, that means you're installing the cam bearing. And if you flip it over, it says remove. Now because you can see remove and read remove, that means you're removing it. So here you have the cam bearing puller. You have this flanged end. 
I'll lube it up with some oil and I'll also take some oil and lightly coat the threads. And then I'll lightly tap it in into the existing cam bearing. And here you have your puller plate. You just wanna make sure you can read remove and then you have an R here for remove on this hole. And then each of these holes, it says R for remove. You just line up the holes with the cam chest and just tighten down these thumb screws nice and snug until your plate is secured to the cam chest. Now I'll just take the dowel pin and insert it until it's fully seated. I'll place the brass washer onto the puller until it's against the plate. And now I'll take the nut and screw it on until it's seated against the washer. So here I'm using a 9 16 wrench on the end of the puller. And for the nut, I'm using an inch and one eighth. And all I'm doing is turning clockwise until I pull out the bearing. So the old bearing is out. I'll disassemble it so I can install the new bearing. So this is the old bearing, but the new bearing has the same lettering and numbering on the outside, and that's gonna be facing away from the motor. So here's your side-by-side -side comparison between your stock cam bearing. As you can see, there's quite a bit of spacing between those rollers. And if you look at your new Timken cam bearing, there's almost zero spacing between those rollers, just making this an all-around better cam bearing. So now that I'm at the reinstalling phase, I'll make sure my workspace is clean and I'll also switch over to some clean shop towels. Now with all my screws, before I reinstall them, I like to thread chase them just to get off all that old Loctite on the threads on the screws and in the holes. So now that I'm ready to install the new cam bearing, here I can read install. So I'll take my installer screw and I'll thread it into here. And then I'll take the two bearing driver tools and I'll set them on here until they're fully seated. So I'll take some new oil and I'll lube up the bearing or you can use some assembly lube. Now just remember that you want the writing facing away from the motor. So I'll take my new cam bearing and I'll place it on the driver with the numbers facing the plate. Now I just make sure that I can read install. So how you had R's for remove, you have I's for install and that's where you'll put in your thumb screws. Now I'll just turn clockwise on the installer screw, making sure that the cam bearing is properly aligned. I'll take my three quarter inch wrench and I'll just turn clockwise until the bearing is fully seated. You just wanna turn until it stops and you feel it seat and you'll feel that bearing seat. So here's the side-by-side -side comparison between the fueling and the Harley OEM cam plate, the oil pump, the cam, and the push rods. And just looking at these two, the OEM is just not up to par with fuelings. So some of the key differences between the fueling cam plate and the OEM cam plate. First, on the fueling cam plate, the oil hole is matched to the engine case hole. On the OEM, the hole is too large, which creates a step at the engine case. Fueling has oil feed holes for the cam thrusting surfaces and an oil groove in the cam bore for a cold start. OEM has nothing. Fueling has 42% more scavenging with matched oil passage volume to the engine case. Fueling has larger kidneys promoting more oil flow and volume. And the fueling cam plate is machined from billet 7075 aluminum which is 50% harder and stronger than the OEM cast. And now for the fueling and the OEM oil pumps. The fueling pump has larger, deeper kidney ports with both pressure and scavenge with larger diameter, high flow gears. Now fueling scavenge port pickup bore and internal passages are matched to the engine case. The OEM has steps. The fueling pump has magnets to help protect the gears and relief valve from debris. Now the fueling pumps are machined from billet aluminum, 
And with the Race Series, you're looking at 7075, which is 50% harder and stronger than the OEM cast material. And with this oil pump, you're looking at sump level reduction. Now Fueling's Bolton Reaper 472 cam is just a great all around camshaft. And obviously there's no comparison when you're comparing it to the OEM. It has a unique idle sound, smooth and quiet lobe design. It has great bottom end with substantial gains above 2,900 RPMs when compared to stock. And it also responds well to your stage one exhaust system and air cleaner. And Fueling has these camshafts available in seven different grinds. Now comparing Fueling versus the OEM stock push rods, the Fueling is obviously a lot thicker. On the tips, there's no ball, it's just one solid piece. I like how they have these labeled with intake and exhaust. Just makes installation a lot easier. Now Fueling does have a video on their channel showcasing these push rods, uh, just showing the tolerances and the flex of these push rods compared to other push rods. I'll leave a link down in the description below. So now I'll get these parts cleaned and prepped. I'll take everything that I took off the bike that I'm reusing, get all that old oil off. These have some packaging grease on them. We want to get that off. I do have the lifters sitting in some oil. That way we can get these uh, pumped up and ready to go. I did make my own pump to get all that air out. I'll show you guys how I did this later. Here I have some Tupperware. Now you can use some PJ1 or some brake cleaner to clean these off. I'll get them wiped down. I'll put them on a clean station and then I'll lube everything up so we can get it on the bike. And while I'm cleaning these up, I'm also inspecting them. So everything is cleaned and prepped and ready for assembly. Now just to note, the screws that were on the oil pump, that was just for packaging to keep everything together so nothing got damaged. They do send you all new screws. So you have oil pump screws, cam plate screws, cam and crank screws, spacers, some new cam chain chin center screws, rocker arm studs and nuts, extra O-rings for your breather valves. Also, I do have the seal that goes on the back of the oil pump. I purchased this from my local Harley Davidson. So if you do plan on purchasing this kit, I do suggest you order the seal in advance. That way you have it when you get your kit. Other than that guys, let's get this lubed up and put on the bike. So I do like to clean up most of the lube on the mating surfaces so the lube doesn't skew my torque. So normally I like to install everything separately. I'll install the oil pump, the cam, and then the cam plate but I'm gonna follow Fueling's instructions and I'm gonna install everything together. So here I'm just using an alignment tool to get this together. So just make sure when you're putting on your screws that you have the washer. So I'm not gonna use Loctite on the oil pump or cam plate screws. Fueling does provide you with some fastener lube that you can use on the screws. So I'm just using this alignment tool so I can get the G-rotor flats to match the crankshaft flats. So if you look at this oil pump seal, you'll know which way it goes. So this fatter side is gonna go towards the oil pump and the skinnier side is gonna go towards the motor. Now you don't wanna smash down on this, just make sure it's properly seated. And I'll also add some assembly lube. So while I'm doing this, I'm still wiping down all the mating surfaces so the lube doesn't skew my torque. So obviously the sprocket gear here is gonna to go towards the cam plate. Now before installing the cam chest assembly, don't forget to add your scavenge port O-ring and your front O-ring. Here I'm just using the Jim's oil pump alignment tool it comes with these two rods and then your G-Rotor alignment tool. Now you can use this tool to install your oil pump separately or you can use it to install the whole assembly. So once again, just make sure your G-Rotor flats are lined up with your crankshaft flats. 
Here, just carefully slide it onto the alignment pins. Now, even though you have all your flats lined up, you might have some trouble getting it on there. You can manipulate your tire a little bit and it'll help it slide on. Push down here so you can get that scavenging port to sit correctly on that O-ring. I'll take the alignment pins out. Now it does take some work to get this to seat. Just make sure that you're pushing firmly and evenly. And you also wanna push down here to make sure that scavenging port is seated correctly. So like I said with the cam plate screws, I'm not using Loctite, I'm using fastening lube. Now I'll just thread in these cam plate screws finger tight. So now with the oil pump and cam plate screws finger tight, I'll rotate the engine a couple of times just to make sure nothing is binding. So I'll tighten and torque the cam plate screws first and I'm going off the service manual for the tightening sequence. So for the cam plate and oil pump screws, I'm using a 5 16th 12 point socket. So the first torque is gonna be 40 inch pounds. Now I'm just watching the flat on the crankshaft and I'll rotate it one time. So the next torque is gonna to be 80 inch pounds. So I'll rotate the engine again. And the final torque is 120 inch pounds. Now that I have the cam plate torqued down to 120 inch pounds, I'll rotate the engine several more times and then I'll tighten and torque the oil pump bolts. So the torque sequence is gonna be the same thing for the oil pump screws. You're gonna tighten to 40, 80, and a final of 120. So I have the cam plate and the oil pump torqued down to final specs. Now what I wanna do is check my sprocket alignment. So I'll take the original spacer and put this on. So I'll take the screw just to hold on to the camshaft. You can't get these wrong. One screw only goes into one. So you have a flat tooth on your sprocket it'll sit on this flat tooth on the camshaft. I'm just using the screw to pull this so I can get this to line up. So I'll take the screw out so I can install the spacer. So I'll install the spacer that comes in the kit. I'll take my crank sprocket and put this one on. Now you don't need to worry about having the timing dots aligned right now. We're just trying to check sprocket alignment. So you do have a spacer that comes in the kit, but I'm gonna use an old washer for now. I'll take the crank screw and screw that in. Now that I have the cam and the crank sprocket on here, I'll take my sprocket locking tool and I'll get these torqued down to 15 foot pounds. So for the cam and crank screw, I'm using a 3 8 12 point socket. Now I just wanna check clearance. So I'll take a straight edge and I'll lay them across the teeth and I'm checking for a gap. And you don't want it to be more than nine thousandths. And here I just have a feeler gauge. I have a .008 and I'll try to get it in here and it's not going, so I'm good to go on the alignment. So now I'll remove these sprockets so we can install the whole assembly. So before you install the sprocket and chain assembly, Make sure you put on your spacer. And then also you want the larger flat tooth on your cam on the top and on your crankshaft. You do want this flat on the top as well. Now for your sprocket and chain assembly, you want these timing dots to line up. You want this flat to be up. Obviously it's gonna be up if you have your timing dot lined up correctly. And then you want this flat for the sprocket to be up to line up with the cam.
I'll take the cam and the crank screw, and I'm using red Loctite on these. I'll take my cam screw with the spacer and put this one in. I'll take the crankshaft screw with spacer and put this one in. So now what I wanna do is get both of these torqued down to 15 foot pounds, and then I'll break them loose and do one full rotation loose. And then I'll do a final torque for the cam, it's 34 foot pounds, and on the crankshaft, is 24 foot pounds. Now, before you install your cam chain tensioner, if you haven't already, just inspect the back plate here. You don't wanna have any burrs or anything sticking up that might mess with the seal. So now I'll install the cam chain tensioner. I'll start off with the bottom screw and then I'll put on the top screw. And with these screws, I'm using blue Loctite. And for these, I'm using a 5 32nd hex bit. So for the cam chain tensioner screws, it's 120 inch pounds. All right, so now it's time to get ready to install the lifters. I'm also gonna go ahead and assemble my push rod covers. I did go with all gloss black. These are from Harley Davidson. I also went with the gloss black lifter covers. Now the fueling kit did come with all new O-rings and gaskets and the push rod cover kit came with these spacers. Now we'll be using some of the components from the chrome ones, like the top push rod cover and the spring in order to assemble these. Now the lifters have been sitting in here for a couple of nights now, but I did make my own vacuum lifter tool. And as you can see, it still pumped out some more air, but I'm still gonna get these out of here and pump them up manually. So here I have my gloss black push rod cover kit. It came with these four lower push rod covers, the spacers, it did not come with these O-rings. These came with the fueling kit. Then you have your spring caps and spring cap retainers. So here I have the chrome push rod cover that I removed. I'll take this one apart. It just slides up just like that. The only pieces you're keeping is the upper push rod cover and the spring. So from the chrome push rod cover that I removed, you do have an O-ring inside of here. So if you plan on reusing this push rod cover, I do suggest that you replace the O-ring or just inspect it just to make sure that it's in good shape. You can just use a picking tool to get it out. So to assemble it, I just take my upper push rod cover. I take my spring cap, slide that on it here. Take my spring, slide that into there. Take my spacer, slide that on. Take my O-ring, slide this on, and then my lower push rod cover slides on like that. And then you have your spring cap retainer that sits on here, and this is gonna put pressure on all the O-rings so you have a tight seal. So when it's sitting on the bike, you have this fat O-ring that sits on the top. Then you have this other O-ring that sits on the bottom inside the lifter cover. So now I'll get the lifters out of my vacuum lifter tool and get them pumped up. You have a small side feed hole right here and that's where you'll pump it. Now there's a few reasons why we pump these up, but really it's so it's not starving for oil on initial startup. So Fueling wants you to install these lifters with the feed holes facing each other. So like I said, I am reusing the stock anti-rotation device. I haven't seen any proof on these failing or breaking. So I'm comfortable with putting this back on. And also Fueling runs this on their race bike and hasn't seen any problems. So I'm not too worried about it. So these are marked with R for rear and F for front. So you'll line up the flats with the anti-rotation device and your lifter. And with the lifter cuff screws, I am using blue Loctite. So I'll install both of the lifter cuffs finger tight, and then I'll rotate the engine just to make sure that they center onto the lifters. So now I'll torque down the lifter cuffs. It's calling for 90 to 120 inch pounds. So I'll tighten them down to 100. And what I'm doing here is just taking a 2000s feeler gauge 
and I'm sticking it between the flats of the lifter and the lifter cuff. That way when I torque it down, they don't bind. Now I'll install the lifter covers. Fueling does provide you with new gaskets. And with these screws, I am using blue Loctite. Now having one of these Allens with the ball end definitely helps with the screws in the back. Now you wanna evenly tighten these down so that gasket seats properly. Now the lifter cover screws are calling for 132 to 156 inch pounds. I'll tighten them down to 140. So it is hard to get a torque wrench on those back screws. So just get them down nice and snug. Now I'll install the push rod covers and don't forget your top and bottom O-rings. So I'll install the bottom first and then I'll take the upper push rod cover and push it up into the top end. So the spring cap retainer puts pressure on all the O-rings so you have a good seal. So on your spring retainer, you do have a flat edge on this side and then on this side, you have a beveled edge. This is gonna go up. So now I'll remove the two breather valves. You have one screw and I'm using a 316 hex bit with an extension. Also, just be careful when you're pulling these out for the first time. I did break the front one. They're made out of plastic, so they're pretty cheap, but they're very inexpensive and you can just purchase a new one at your local Harley Davidson. So the O-ring groove on this valve, it's too large for the O-ring that's on there now which compromises the seal and function of the breather. So adding this additional O-ring will help hold it in position and assist in sealing. All right guys, so I can't help myself. The more I look at these lower rocker covers, the more I wanna take them off. I'm doing gloss black everywhere else and then I have these chrome lower rocker covers. I'm sure you guys saw that too, so I'm taking these things off. I don't know if I'm doing gloss black or billiard red yet, We'll see. Now to remove the lower rocker covers, you have a total of five screws. You have a screw on each corner and then you have a center stud. So for the four corner screws, I'm using a 3 8 socket with an extension. So you wanna remove the four outer screws first and then the center stud. Now for the center stud, it's a 7 16 socket. So I'll use a rubber mallet and tap it lightly to knock it loose. So I'll pull it up slowly, being careful not to damage my valve springs, and I'll also guide it around the ACR valve. Now it's the exact same thing for the front. Now that I removed the lower rocker covers, it is a little easier to access the spark plugs on the right side. So I'll go ahead and remove those now and I'm using a 5 8 deep socket. So the torque on these spark plugs is between 89 and 133 inch pounds. I'll tighten them down to 120. All right, so as you can see, I went with the billiard red. I couldn't leave these old rocker box covers chrome when I'm blacking everything out. So I took it over to Ricky HD over at Trigger City Chop Shop. He definitely hooked it up. If you don't know who that is, make sure you go check him out on his YouTube channel as well as Instagram. All right, so here I have the lower rocker box cover. 
I went ahead and purchased new gaskets. Now these don't come in the kit because the fueling cam chest kit only requires you to remove the top rocker box cover. Because I wanted to get these done, I went ahead and purchased gaskets. Now, when you insert these gaskets into the channel, you just wanna make sure that you clean out that channel. You don't want anything in there that may cause this to leak. And for these gaskets, I did purchase these off of Parts Giant. I'll put a link down in the description below. Now with these, before you mount them on, you just wanna make sure you have a clean surface. You don't wanna have any nicks or any type of metal sticking up. Now before I reinstall the lower rocker box covers, I'm gonna make sure I have a clean surface. And for the screws and the stud, I'll apply some blue Loctite. So there is a torque sequence for the screws and the stud. It's basically a cross pattern. Your rear right is one, and then you go from there. And then the last one is the stud. So the torque specs on the screws and the stud, it's calling for 90 to 120 inch pounds. I'll tighten them down to 110. And it's gonna be the same thing for the front. So now I'll reinstall the rear and front breathers. Just make sure you have the O-ring that fueling provided in the kit installed. And with these breathers, they are specific to which one goes to the rear and which one goes to the front. And for these breather screws, it's calling for 90 to 120 inch pounds. I'll torque them down to 110. So fueling provides you with these rock arm studs and nuts. They help relieve the stress on the Milwaukee cylinder heads. The factory and Screaming Eagle cylinder heads have an extremely weak link with the rocker arm shaft standoffs. By using these studs, some of the stress is transferred from the standoff casing and into the stud. I'll apply a little bit of red Loctite. So you'll start off by double nutting the stud on the fine threads. The coarse threads are gonna go into the cylinder head. And I'll torque these studs down to five foot pounds. So what's great about these push rods is that fueling mark these with intake and exhaust so there's no confusion there. And with these push rods, you just wanna make sure that the oiling channel is clear and open. So the closest push rod to the motor is gonna be your intake and the outer rod is gonna be your exhaust. So you wanna make sure that you clean up and inspect your rocker arms and your rocker arm shafts. Also on your rocker arms, you wanna inspect your oiling holes, make sure they're clear and open. That way oil can flow freely and lube up your valve springs. So I'll use some assembly lube and lube up the rocker shafts, rocker arm bushings, standoffs, and rocker arm side thrusting surfaces. Basically, you wanna lube up anywhere that has metal on metal contact. Also, you wanna pump up your rocker arms. Now you also wanna pump up your push rods. So same way that I removed the rocker arms, I'm gonna reinstall them. I'm gonna find base circle on the front. So I'll rotate the tire until these two push rods are moving together. All that means is that the rear is at the top dead center of the compression stroke and I can reinstall the rear. So I'll apply some red Loctite to the studs and then I'll apply some fastener assembly lube to the underhead flange of the nuts. So I'll tighten these down evenly and then I'll torque them down to 10 foot pounds and then I'll loosen them up one full rotation to allow the shaft to settle in and then I'll re-tighten evenly and step the torque to a final 24 
to 26 foot pounds. So to tighten and torque these down, I'm using a 12.38 socket. Now the same thing goes for the front cylinder. All right, now that I have everything installed, it's time to put on the rocker covers. Now you wanna make sure that you put on the new gasket that comes in the kit. There is a torque sequence when it comes to these. You wanna make sure that you tighten these down and torque them down evenly. You don't want this twisting on you and possibly ruining your gasket. And I also like to make sure that everything is clean and cleared out before I put these back on. Pretty simple guys, so let's get them on. Now before you put on your new gaskets, you wanna make sure that all your mating surfaces are cleaned off. Now when you're installing your rocker cover, you also want to check the clearance between the bottom of the rocker cover and your rocker arms. We did just install all new parts, so you want to make sure that nothing's going to be knocking in there. So I'll get these all finger tight first in that same tightening sequence. And with all these screws, I'll apply some blue Loctite. So I'll torque these down in sequence and it's calling for 120 to 140 inch pounds. I'll torque them down to 130. And it's the same thing for the rear cover. Now, if you can't fit your torque wrench in the rear, just get them down nice and snug, but you don't want to over tighten. Now, I'll reinstall the old coolant lines. Now, you just want to make sure that you get this all cleaned out and you change out your O-rings. Now, Fueling does provide you with new O-rings in the kit. So, same thing, I'll reinstall the old coolant lines from the left side. Just make sure that your new O-rings are fully seated on the ports of each manifold. So I'll get the screws in the rear and the front finger tight first, just to make sure that the holes are lined up and everything is seated, and then I'll tighten them down. Now when you tighten down these manifold screws, you wanna tighten them down evenly, that way it seats properly. So for these oil line manifold screws, it's calling for 90 to 120 inch pounds, I'll tighten them down to 110. Now for the front manifold screws, it's gonna be hard to get a torque wrench in there because of that oil coolant line. So just get them down nice and snug. And don't forget to reconnect your down tubes. Now I'll reconnect all the connectors. I'll reconnect the fuel injectors, the knock sensors and when you reconnect your knock sensor just make sure you lock it the ACR connectors and I'll reinstall the left and right spark plugs so the torque value on these spark plugs is 89 to 133 inch pounds. I'll torque them down to 110. And now I'll reinstall the front engine mount. I'll get these fingers started first so I can get the holes to line up and then I'll tighten them down. So the torque value on the upper front engine mount stabilizer link screws 
It's calling for 30 to 35 foot-pounds. I'll torque it down to 30. Now for the engine stabilizer bracket screws, it's calling for 45 to 50 foot-pounds. I'll torque it down to 45. Now I'll reinstall the horn. To the horn bracket, to the cylinder head screws, it's calling for 35 to 40 foot-pounds. I'll torque it down to 35. All right guys, so now it's time to install the cam cover. Now there is a tightening sequence to this. You just wanna make sure that you tighten them down evenly and then torque them down evenly. And fueling also provides you with a new gasket. So just line the gasket up with the cover. So for the cam cover screws, it's calling for 90 to 120 inch pounds. I'll torque them down to 110. And to give this the final touch, I'm installing the fueling time cover. Now the torque value on these time cover screws is 25 to 35 inch pounds.